So this week, uh, you've been talking a lot about a research question, a lot about narrowing down research question, that sort of thing. So some of this will be what we, you know, have already talked about. Um, some of it should be new, uh, or at least a slightly different way to think about things, and then some, some of it will be completely new. Um, you can think of, especially the initial material, as being kind of a checklist for you. Uh, you know, this process that you've been going through, have you really thought everything through? And uh, so, let's start. Okay, so, uh, first of all, uh, what's a research question? Okay, so a research question is a question around which you center your research. You should ask a question about an issue that you are genuinely curious or passionate about. This is this is going to be, as you probably saw with the four moves uh, in the Detox Your Writing book, the research questions are the basis of everything. Um, that is, you know, kind of determining the pathway through uh, the research that you're doing. It's determining how you're going to frame uh, the methodology, how you're going to frame the analysis, the conclusions, pretty much everything. And it's, it's the thing that you keep coming back to and coming back to and coming back to. This is, you know, are these the questions that I really want to be asking? So here's, a, here's just a little checklist, okay, of things to think about with regard to your research question. Um, is it clear? Um, it provides enough specifics that uh, the audience can easily understand its purpose without needing additional explanation. Uh, you have already <coughs> done kind of a preamble in chapter one, and so they have the basic terminology, they have the basic context of the, of the research study. Um, can these research questions stand on their own without a lot more explanation? Um, the second is, is it focused? Is it narrow enough? And this is what we've been talking about all week, that it can be answered thoroughly in the space of the dissertation or whatever research you're doing. Is it concise? <clears throat> is it ex uh, expressed in the fewest possible words? Uh, we call this parsimony, uh, that the uh, questions are parsimonious. And uh, so if you kind of cut the fluff out, cut the fat out, um, you really just pared it down to the essential question. However, that said, is it also still complex? Is it something more than just a yes or no kind of question? Um, does it require synthesis? Does it require analysis? Um, because after all, that's what you're getting ready to do. And uh, is it arguable? Um, is potential answers are open to debate rather than being accepted facts? Even if it's not just a yes-no question, it still could be something that people in general say, yeah, yeah, sure, you know. Um, you know, is this method effective in the classroom? Yeah, sure, that's fine, you know. So... <laughs> Next question, you know, so you, you want it to be something that you're actually going to have to, as Detox Your Writing was talking about, put yourself into, you know, the, the writing and to actually make the case about this thing. Questions about any of that? All right. So uh, why is a research question essential to the research process? Because it helps focus you as the researcher on the research that you're doing and providing a path for the research. Um, so what are the steps to developing a research question? Now obviously again you've been through some of this already um, so you know some of this will be obvious some of it perhaps less so. All right so uh, steps to developing a question um, you're going to choose a general interest topic now of course for the mock dissertation that was chosen you know in a sense for you. You only had four choices. Um, but for the dissertation, uh, it's going to be something that you're you know, already kind of pursuing, that you're already interested in. As I was explaining with my dissertation and the interest that I came into the program with, uh, it's like that. I, I would not necessarily base my dissertation on something that I knew nothing about. <laughs> um, it, it's, and, and just bearing in mind that you're going to be working with this for months and years, and so you really need something that is going to keep you, you engaged as well as your readers, you know, ultimately. So, um, 
some nice general topics, okay, would be, for instance, single gender classrooms or new teacher mentoring, those kind of, you know, general ideas. But those topics have lots of variables associated with them. And that then is this process of narrowing down, okay? So then you're going to do some preliminary research on the general topic, do the lit review, uh, as you've already done for the mock uh, dissertation, and uh, you're trying to discover what the issues are that the scholars and researchers are talking about. What do people care about? And by their absence, what do people not care about? Okay? That's almost as important. <laughs> um, and uh, let me uh, say it this way. There, there are some issues that have been around a long time, okay? Uh, there are some that are brand new, but there are some that have been around a long time. And people have simply answered those questions, you know, and they moved on. So if you're asking a question about the thing that everybody's decided that is already answered and they've moved on, that's really, really, really going to hurt you. So um, looking through the lit review, uh, you know, looking at the, the end of the studies, <coughs> what are they suggesting for future research? Those are, you know, good indicators of what might be good research questions. But then also, if you're not finding the thing that you're particularly interested in, this, you know, whatever that question is, do a search actually on the question, okay? Not just the topic, but that question, and see what you get. And if what you're getting is everything from the 90s, just abandon shit, okay? Because something happened, okay? <laughs> you know, either all the questions were answered or everybody decided, I don't care, and they just left it behind, right? Um, and I've, I've had this happen in, especially in Research One, uh, people will find these kind of older uh, sources, and they're older not because they're seminal, that they're super important, and they've been super influential for decades, they're just old, you know. And, and so the, someone, someone is actually presenting them as if this is a new idea, and this idea has actually been around for decades, and people pretty much figured it out. So be able to discern, you know, between those things. But you know a lot of things in the newspaper, people call you the same thing, sure. a lot of different names, so yes. we feel like it's an old trend that could certainly make a comeback. Can we that Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. potentially. I mean, assuming that there's actually some kind of significant difference between what happened before and what's happening now, yes. But absolutely, boy, we, we are cyclical uh, in our educational innovations. Um, okay, so then uh, consider your audience. And I want just to mention this because uh, this is not obvious sometimes in doing dissertation research, and that is that the audience that you are writing for right now, let's talk about your dissertation, let's say you're committing, okay, is not necessarily the audience who's going to be reading this stuff later, okay? Now, you know, you, you may be writing for a bunch of academics now, but you may actually ultimately want practitioners to read your, your study. And so if that's the case, well, then your research questions really should have a more practical nature to them and not just ask a lot of theoretical questions, okay? So, you know, consider, you know, imagine yourself, you know, close your eyes and imagine yourself, um, years from now, and your dissertation's done, your program's done, you're, you're a doctor, whoever, and, um, and now you're standing up in front of a conference or you're standing up in front of a school board or you're standing up in front of the state, you know, school board or, um, you know, just anything, or you're ready for a journal. You know, what do you want those people to know? What kind of questions do you want to ask for those people? Um, and, and so try to strike a balance there uh, between those two kinds of questions. Theoretical questions are not bad, uh, but mostly in a conference setting or something like that, people don't care about that. Mostly they want to know, what can I implement tomorrow? Okay. Um, so, um, good. All right, then start asking questions. Um, 
taking into consideration all of the above, okay, start asking yourself some open-ended questions, some how questions, some why questions. Uh, for example, how effective have single-gender classrooms been in encouraging females to study STEM subjects? Okay, now that is a different, you know, that's way more narrow uh, than asking about single-gender classrooms, okay? That is also something that is, uh, you can find data for and you can analyze, you know, and you can actually answer. Um, so try best you can, you can't always do this, but try best you can uh, to make the research questions um, measurable. That is, you know, I, at the end of the day, I'm able to say not only like a yes or no or something like that, but how much and to what extent and why and how and, you know, just really I'm able to kind of wrap my arms around it and answer the questions, okay? Um, here's another one just for fun. Uh, does effective mentoring, remember I was talking about mentoring new teachers, does effective mentoring influence the rate at which new teachers stay in the profession? Okay, well, that's a very specific question with very specific data and, and also very, you know, eminently answerable, okay? Um, so I suggest, this is just me, <clears throat> the standard kind of accepted numbers are three to five questions uh, that, you've, that you're, you know, everything's honing down to those three to five questions and that's what you're gonna roll with, all right, uh, for your study, whatever kind of study you're doing. All right, then evaluate your questions. Um, after you've put a question or even a couple of questions down, then evaluate the question to determine whether they would be effective research questions or whether they need more revising. And now we're going back to the previous list that I had up before, okay? Um, you know, this, okay? The clear, the focused, the concise, the complex, the arguable, okay? Um, so, as I've already stated, research is, is an iterative process, so you just keep coming back and come back and check and check and check. So, is the research question clear? With so much research available on a given talk, topic, research questions have to be clear in order for you to differentiate your work from somebody else's. Okay, so is that, is that difference clear? Is it focused? Research questions have to be specific enough to be easily addressed uh, through the data collection and, and analysis. And is the research question complex beyond yes or no? Okay. Um, all right, and then begin your research. Uh, after you come up with the questions, think through the possible paths. Through the research, what sources should you consult? Uh, who should you talk to? What research process will ensure that you find a variety of perspectives and responses? Okay. Um, here's one thing you shouldn't do. Okay? Uh, this is considered bad form in research. Okay. Um, you come up with research questions, you collect your data, you analyze your data, and your uh, questions just don't kind of don't pay You know, you said that there would be a difference between these two schools and districts and everything else like that, there's no difference whatsoever. Um, people will, unscrupulous people, will go back and change their research questions. Um, and you can tell when this has been done because when you get to the analysis, everything absolutely matches. You know, everything, all the questions are easily answered out of the data analysis and everything is obviously wrong. Mostly life is like that, and definitely education is like that. So if there's a messiness to it, that actually kind of indicates an authenticity, and that's not a bad thing, okay? Um, so I'm suggesting you're doing all this work on the front end with the research questions, and you're really getting them to the place where you're going to just run with these hypotheses, and, and that's it. You're just going to, you're going to play your flag. And this is what I think, okay, or this is the most important question I can ask, and you're just going to say, let the chip fall in the middle, you know. Um, not getting what you thought would happen in a research question is not the worst thing that's ever happened, okay. Um, there are all sorts of innovations, as you know, in education that don't pan out, that are not effective. 
Mostly we don't know about that or we spend a lot of money and finally give up on that because there's no research. You know? So there's nothing to tell us this is a waste of money. This is a waste of time. Some good research tells us there is no difference between these two groups, these two schools, these two districts that are doing two different you know, kind of interventions or whatever. That is good information, <laughs> okay? And you know, that's gonna tell somebody, hey, maybe just let's, let's funnel the money someplace else. You know, we don't need to be doing this for 20 years. So, so don't be so over-concerned that everything pans out in terms of these huge differences you know, between these groups and everything else like that. Look at me, and I'm really excited. Okay, um, well, let's look at some sample research questions, okay? Um, are mobile phones harming students? <laughs> well, see, that's what you would read, like, in a newspaper headline, okay? Um, or, you know, on the internet or something like that, on Facebook. And, and all it's meant to do is get your attention. It's not informative at all, okay? And it's definitely not any kind of hypothesis that somebody's testing. All right. What you want to do <laughs> is you want to talk about well, what about the mobile phones and what about the harm, you know? Um, so use of social networking on mobile phones. Is it negatively affecting students' attention span in class? That's a little bit more directed, a little bit more focused. You could even say seventh grade students, you know, or something like that and be even a little bit more focused. But the whole idea is you know exactly what you're looking for. And your reader knows exactly what you're looking for. And so you don't need to go on a fishing expedition. Uh, everything that you can do with a mobile phone and all kinds of harm that can possibly be done to a student. Okay? Um, does that make sense? I'm sorry I'm still getting this kind of sunlight thing happening here. Um, all right, a little bit unfocused. Are school climate and culture important? Well, again, there we are with the yes, no. You know, probably most people would say yes and move on. Um, here's another way to say that. To what extent do seventh grade teachers, teacher expectations and support influence student end of grade test scores? Well, um, I can definitely get at seventh grade teacher expectations and support, you know, for instance, through survey, through interview, things like that, I can definitely also get to integrate test scores. These are things that are manageable. I can, I can have them in my hands, and I can compare, and I can look, and I can answer the question. And that's exactly what you're looking for, okay? Um, not the headline. Is that right? Um, and then in terms of, you know, simplicity, okay? Um, too simple. Are legislators addressing school violence in South Carolina? You know, some of you would say, well, I sure hope so. You know, uh, appropriately complex. And, and imagine now, okay, like you're going to do research on this question. To what extent are South Carolina state legislators aware of the effect of gun violence in schools and passing appropriate legislation to make schools safer? Okay, well, that's a dissertation. That's, <laughs> that's, that's really... Uh, a, a very serious kind of study, yet the data is there, or the data can be collected, okay? Um, so, again, not just yes or no, and, uh, but, you know, and it's, it's appropriately complex. It's not complex just to be complex. It's not complicated. There's a difference between complicated and complex. There's a difference between difficult and complex, you know? We're looking for something that's interesting. If you don't like the word complex, think about interesting. What, it, what would be interesting for the reader to know? What would be interesting for you to know? Okay. Um, that's, that's what we're trying to get at. <coughs> Question about that? All right, now, here's the thing that we haven't talked about at all this week. Uh, directionality, direction and magnitude of questions. Once you've done all of this narrowing down, once you've done all this focusing and, you know, make sure the complexity is there, all these kinds of things, you actually are not quite done, okay? Um, because you also need to decide 
how far out of the limb you're going to go in asking your question. There are safe questions to ask, and there are less safe questions to ask. You ask the less safe question if in your lit review you found a fair amount of evidence for whatever it is that you're looking at. Okay? Um, you ask the more safe question when there really isn't much there and, and you really don't know. Okay? Um, so let's, let's talk about this. So research questions are often asked in terms of both magnitude, how much, and direction, which is greater. Okay? Again, thinking in terms of two classes, two schools, two districts, whatever, okay? and some kind of intervention like a reading intervention, something like that. It's not a requirement. It's not a requirement. Um, you can simply say there's a difference, you know, or there, there will be a difference. Um, and, and that's completely acceptable. However, if there is a rich literature on your topic and people have done a lot of research and you're trying to differentiate your research from other people's research, probably you're going to need to go a little bit further than that. You're going to need to go a little bit farther out of the limb. But the literature also should indicate, like, what is a good direction, which, you know, which direction on the limb would be a good, good idea. All right, so first let me say, if you're doing qualitative inquiry, there's no anticipation that there is even going to be a hypothesis, okay? Because most qualitative inquiry is exploratory. Right? So you would ask a question, for instance, how do women in a doctoral program describe their decision to return to school? Well, that's not, you know, greater than, less than, you know, more, you know, or anything else like that. It's just we want to find out. We want to answer this question. Okay? And that's mostly because there's no research on that. Like this is a new kind of area. And we're trying to find out. Because it's qualitative inquiry that often gives us the theories and the hypotheses for the quantitative. Okay? It's, it's the qualitative that kind of leads us in a certain direction, and then we have enough to be able to say, okay, here's my theory, here's my hypothesis, and we're going to test this out. Okay? Um, so this is an exploratory question. There's no hypothesis. Therefore, no need to specify magnitude or direction. Okay? So that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a more quantitative kind of question <coughs> where you have you know, some kind of data that is not just, I don't know, interview transcripts or something like that. Um, it's maybe survey data, maybe um, you know, test scores, things like that. So let's talk about that. All right, first, some statistical language. Okay, uh, and you may run into this in your master's program, but just in case you do. Okay? There is this thing that we start with with every study. <coughs> every study where there is a hypothesis okay, of any description whatsoever. And it's called the null hypothesis. And null is nothing, okay, as we know from uh, mathematics. And so <coughs> what we're saying with the null hypothesis is whatever you know, groups we're talking about, schools we're talking about, districts we're talking about, um, that's the assumption that there's no difference between them. Okay, just the beginning assumption, there's nothing, there's nothing uh, different between them on this particular test score or whatever it is that we're looking at, this variable. Okay? Um, now, if we find that there's no difference, in fact, we, you know, we've gone through the analysis and uh, sure enough, okay, uh, there's no difference between these groups, we are confirming the null hypothesis. That's the language. <coughs> Whereas, if we find there is a difference, and mostly we want that, okay, with these various interventions, we are failing to confirm the null hypothesis. That sounds bad, but it's the best thing that could possibly happen. Okay? Um, we are saying, basically, we can't confirm that there's no difference, and in fact there is a difference. Um, so, uh, that assumes in your research question, you said that there would be a difference. Okay, so that would be confirmation of your research question, but it would be a failure to confirm the null hypothesis. So I hope that's not overly complicated. 
but that is the statistical language that's used. Um, so that said, okay, um, there is a non-directional hypothesis, and then there's directional hypothesis. Okay, non-directional hypothesis is it, it just tests that there will be a difference. It does not specify the direction of the difference. So we're saying <clears throat> there's a difference between the seventh grade and the sixth grade on some particular intervention. Okay, we don't say you know in what direction it's going to be. We don't say seventh grade will be better than sixth grade. We don't say the other way around. We just say that there's going to be a difference. That is that safe hypothesis. Okay, um, and again, if you don't know a lot, if the literature doesn't show a lot in terms of whatever this question is, then that's actually probably a pretty good route to go, that non-directional hypothesis. However, if you've got enough to be able to say um, a direction, then you probably ought to. Okay? Again, a way to distinguish your research. So some non-directional hypotheses. Um, is there a difference in homogeneity, her heterogeneity of the population between the U.S. and those countries in the top 10 of the PISA ranking? We're just asking if there's a difference. If there is a difference, then, uh, you know, then that's, that's a great thing. We, you know, we're asking if there is a difference um, we're with the hypothesis that there will be a difference. And sure enough, there was a difference. Um, also, is there a difference in retention of congregants in churches with 2,000 or more congregants, that is mega churches, than those churches with less than 2,000 congregants? Um, again, just a difference. So we're not saying one is better, different, whatever. Um, we're just saying, you know, that there is, in in some way, shape, or form, um, there is a measurable difference between these two things. All right, whereas in the directional hypothesis, um, we are saying not only that there's a difference, but we're saying where the difference lies, okay? So for example, is the population of the U.S. more heter heterogeneous than those countries in the top 10 of the PISA ranking? Now I'm putting it on the U.S., <laughs> you know, I'm saying that, you know, it, this is more heterogeneous, um, and that's what I'm testing with my analysis. Uh, also, do churches with 2,000 or more congregants, the mega churches, retain their congregants better than churches with less than 2,000 congregants? You can easily say it the other way around. It just depends on the literature, as what the literature says. Um, and if it seems pretty clear from the literature, I would say just go with a directional hypothesis because that's gonna allow you to make a more bold statement at the end, in chapter five, in your conclusions. The, the farther out on the limb that you've gone, then the more you will have to say uh, when you are discussing your analysis. Okay? Would you like to ask me a question? All right, and then magnitude. Uh, this should be it. Okay, so uh, suppose we do determine directionality, okay? Can we also determine magnitude? That is, we not only say there's a difference, and we not only say the direction of the difference, but we also say how much, okay? Um, <clears throat> we can do this in statistical terminology or non-statistical terminology. Um, you know, that there may be a, an exceptional difference, you know, between these two, or we can say uh, there will be a statistically significant difference between these two, whatever it is. Um, if we're going to appeal to statistics, though, you know, we've got some kind of quantifiable data, you know, that, that we can actually do that kind of analysis with. <coughs> All right, so, uh, for example, do churches with 2,000 or more congregants, megachurches, retain their congregants significantly better or at a significantly higher level or higher percentage than churches with less than 2,000 congregants? Okay. Now, we not only have a hypothesis, we not only have direction to the hypothesis, 
We also had magnitude hypothesis. This is by far the strongest kind of hypothesis, the strongest kind of research question. And you just put significantly in there, basically. Right? Yes. Yeah. Now, if you say significantly, please know that people are going to be expecting the statistics to back that up. Okay. There are other words that you can use. Okay. That that are not <coughs> significantly. Um, that would simply indicate that there's a large difference or something like that. Um, I mean, you can even say a measurable difference you know, between these two. That's fine. But if you say uh, significantly different, then, then probably people are going to expect a few value and, you know, compared to 0.05 and blah, blah, blah. And one thing I, I do want to say that's uh, kind of new and that's happening in the last few years is in these kinds of studies uh, involving statistics, it has been accepted for almost 100 years that you have to have a level of statistical significance, uh, you know, p equal to 0.05, p equal to 0.01, something like that. Where, and, and just to quickly explain, um, what you're saying with 0.05 and 0.01 is that there's only a 5% chance that this uh, would happen randomly. Okay, basically you're 95% confident in this result. Whereas 0.01 would be like, there's only 1% chance of this being random. I'm 99% confident, okay? That's, that's all that's saying. Um, that has come under great question, great question. Uh, because basically, people are able to come up with statistics that are significantly different, but it still doesn't really tell you if it's important. It's just significantly different, that's all. Um, so, so people are actually okay these days with there simply being a difference. Or there's a difference, but it's not significantly different. Okay? And that's okay. Because people understand it's the difference that we're really talking about. That's actually the thing that matters. You know? um, so uh, that's kind of nice uh, in this day and age that we are in. I'm, I'm here to tell you, and, and just have to take my word for it, this is a great time to do research. This is a great time. Because things are loosening up that used to be just so hard and firm uh, in terms of the language that you use and in terms of the statistics that you use. All these kinds of things are just kind of loosening up. And also the use of qualitative inquiry. All these kinds of things that just are, are I think, the best thing that could possibly happen to research. Um, so, yeah, I think it's a really good time. Um, yeah, so I think that's what I got. So, what kind of questions do you have? Yeah. All right, this is going to be a kind of a more specific, um, not a research question, but you had mentioned, you basically kind of said what my research question kind of is earlier about right. the um, mentors. I can't remember how you worded it. But with induction teachers right. and all that good stuff. And retention. Retention, yeah. yes. Thank you. So um, to focus that down more, because that's been one thing I've thought about this week, is how do I narrow my focus a little bit? Um, I feel like for right now, you know, obviously I have access to district information for like our pilot that we're doing. So I feel like that's going to be my starting point. Yeah. But when I broaden it, if I do decide that that's going to be my dissertation topic, um, what would be a good or, or a reasonable sample size? I'm, obviously, the state of South Carolina comes to mind, but at the same right. time, I'm like, I need to get. Yeah. Um, so my looking at mentor, the mentor side of it, mm -hmm. the mentor training, but they also they also um, send out surveys to the teachers that were mentored by these people for throughout the state. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if, I mean, I would be glad to. Split it with you if that's fine with you and fine with them. Mm -hmm. If you want to do that, because it's going to be the whole, I think the whole state. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. And well, so, we, what we you can do, um, there are different ways to kind of slice data um, <clears throat> rather than do 50 uh, 50. Okay? <laughs> what you can do is, um, you know, every third entry or every, you know, or even a random number, you uh -huh. know. Um, so you've got them all lined up, it's lines one through a thousand, whatever, um, and you're just generating random numbers and choosing 
those cases. Okay, mm -hmm. I would I would suggest that more. Um, but you're you're talking about like you're going to take the mentor to the mentor and you're going to take the industry we take the whole oh, thing okay. together. But okay. I, okay. I, I was the actual one. Sorry. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't understand. Yeah. Sorry. Um, I, I probably didn't quite well. Then, I, I, then, I, then your question is what I'm talking about. Okay. So rather than dealing with thousands of people, okay. um, you can definitely cut it down. But you need to cut it down in some kind of systematic way, okay. not just the top half. Or, you know what I'm saying? Um, and and make sure it's representative. Okay. Um, you can also do it by districts. You know, you can make sure that you've got representation for all districts. You know, that kind of thing. So um, it would be worthwhile to think through the different strategies. Now, your question reminded me of somebody else's question from, from before, uh, and that is, how, how related should the research question be, okay? To each other? To each other. Um, so I've heard all sorts of things this week, um, and that is, you know, for instance, you know, they, they should be kind of, you know, their own thing, um, or, you know, they should all be related together. Here's my take on it. I think that you are looking, and I'm going to come back to the looking at the model, okay? I think you're looking at this one thing, and you just want to look at it from different sides. I don't necessarily think you want to look at two things, and three things, and four things, okay? But I think you want to look at different aspects of basically the same theme, uh, you know, the, and, and so how many different ways can you ask good questions about essentially the same idea so that you can get at different um, aspects of it. So, for instance, um, you know that you've got quantitative data, okay? Um, are there um, qualitative interviews that could be done, okay? And what would they show? So that's, that's two, different, sorry, two different sides of the same thing. You're just trying to get at more information. Is there something else that could be done? Um, you know, these surveys or something, you know, there's, there's a lot of ways that you can look at one data set, and then there are also multiple data sets that you can look at to get at one concept mm -hmm. or, you know, one, mm -hmm. one theme. So think through that, too. Um, and because I, I personally don't know, when I read research, I personally don't know that I'm so interested in hearing about this question and this question and this question because it's so hard to pull them together at the end um, and make it something coherent. But if, if I'm talking about different sides of the same thing, that's natural, that's easy to pull it all together. So just think about that too, um, in, in, especially in terms of dissertation, but even the mock dissertation. So I need that minimum of 30? Yeah, minimum of 30, I would say. So this would be kind of where we're pulling that whole mixed methods this would be the thing together. Right? Yeah. So let's say that I used um, the quantitative data, uh -huh. like Jolie was talking about, right. but I also had surveys of different teachers yeah. or you know, case studies of specific or, or so. Yeah, That's how I'm pulling the qualitative yes. and the quantitative together. Right. But maybe I'm looking at like perceptions over here, yeah. and I'm looking at like more of a statistical. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Something. It, yeah. Okay. And you can talk about the qualitative as almost like confirming, mm -hmm. you know, the, the quantitative. The yeah, right, okay. exactly. Um, and that's a good way to go about it. Or, or uh, if nobody's looked at this qualitative data, or nobody's really collected this kind of qualitative data, you can just make an explosion. Okay. You know, um, so what are the perceptions? rather than the perceptions will be, you know. Um, so, yeah. Okay. okay. Something else? Somebody else? I just sort of have a general question about choosing a topic. Like, yeah. I guess, how much of it is our own personal, like, brainchild versus, like, influence from, I don't know, I guess I'm coming from our perspective of a lot of my friends with PhDs are in science. So like, you know, my friend that has this doctorate in fisheries research flounder because that's what the school had funding for. Yes, um, yes. They, you know, another person researched Watermelon <laughs> because that was like a you know follow-up question to her own chairs. 
research. Like I feel like with education, we're not as limited by funding. So mm -hmm. is it more of our own? It's pretty passion? much your your own thing. And here's here's why. Um, and you know, maybe I wish it, this was different, but maybe I don't. Um, we are not a research institution. You know, so we don't have these big agendas going. You know, and then you just kind of you know come with me and you know do what I've been doing. Um, no, so I, it's pretty much up to you uh, as far as I'm concerned. Do we have a chance to sit with like an uh, handful of each other or with professors to like sort of help with that narrowing process? Oh, sure. Mm -hmm. um, and and we can uh, you know uh, outside of this week. We can always, uh, we can always just you know play around with ideas. And, you know, I'm I'm happy to do that. I, everybody's happy to do that. So, um, just a kind of random question: How often do you see um, dissertations or research in general where people pick up where someone else's study left off? Is that all the time? All the time. Okay, all so the that time. is a very common thing. Yes. Um, you know. Uh, we've got a lot of research out there that has never been confirmed. Never been, nobody's ever done a second study. And it's, it's a crying shame. Because you can absolutely get one set of results with one sample, you go to another sample and get a completely set of different, you know. But, you know, we, we've got that one result, and this is, by the way, uh, this is what makes headlines, okay? Right. These kinds of studies make headlines. The one-off, and we found this amazing difference. This was incredible. What you never hear about is nobody else was able to confirm what that first group found, you know. And uh, and so yeah, it calls the whole thing into question, and everything else like that. So that's why I'm saying, go to the end of these studies, look at the recommended research. That's a great place to pick up, you know. And especially if you think very highly of that study that you just read. And this is fascinating. Look, you know, yeah, you know, um, and and that researcher would love it, you know. Uh, so I highly recommend. Are we allowed to replicate the study for our own dissertation, or like Yeah, as long as there's something that would distinguish it, you know, from from the other. Really close. I didn't know you liked the building thing until I got on the front with and the family. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I mean, for instance, okay, for instance, let's say somebody has done a study, uh, education within California, you know, and, uh, and you want to do it for South Carolina, or they did it for an urban population, you want to do it for a rural population. That's totally legit. That's totally legit. Um, so, uh, that, in fact, that is the kind of research that's really because we know about this thing over here, but we don't really know, you know, everybody else. Yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. And that's what we do all the time in education. Like <laughs> one size fits all. Precisely. Um, so I, I think there's a lot of legitimacy in that kind of research. Yeah. Um, when we're going through the process with our, in our dissertation committee, how often do we like talk to them, send them stuff, or just like when we reach? Yeah. Yeah. Proposal time, you send your proposal to them, and then yeah, I mean, you potentially could send individual chapters to the chair. I'm not sure I would send it to everybody. Um, you might want to run your chapter three past the methodologist, um, and maybe you want to run the chapter two by the reader um, just to get a sense of, you know, have I really uh, have I found everything that I should have found in the literature? Uh, so yeah, I mean, you know, I think that's that's okay. Um, I would be okay. Good question. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good deal. Okay. All right. All right.